Thank you, Shireen, for that introduction. I kind of wish there was more of a step stool here. Um, well, as, as you all know, my name is Molly Sarver. Uh, I was just recently hired with the Indiana County Office of Planning and Development. This past February, I started working with the Sustainable Task Force as an intern. From there, I became their sustainability coordinator as an independent contractor, and I'm going to continue working with them as a county employee. A lot has happened in the past year, so I'm going to try and catch you all up in 15 minutes. For those of you, oh, someone told my, uh, took my clicker. There it is. Sorry about that. All right. Oh, there we go. For those of you who don't know, the idea of the task force came out of the first summit, then called the Sustainable Economy Summit, held by our commissioners in April 2017. As a result of that meeting, Commissioners Baker, Ruddick, Hess, uh, and Hess established the task force in May 2017. They did this in partnership with Evergreen Conservancy, the Center for Community Growth, and the League of Women Voters, who helped fund this event today. The task force was officially launched in September 2017 with the goal to identify new opportunities for our community in four sectors. Those are ag uh, sustainable agriculture, renewable energy, building construction and materials, and environmental restoration and stewardship. We now refer to these sectors as focuses. Within each of these respective fo uh, within each focus, respe their respective focus groups were tasked with finding opportunities related to economic development, workforce development, and citizen education. And so, from September 2017 to 2018, the task force and its focus groups began a one-year participatory process that involved engaging stakeholders like local businesses, grassroots organizations, and community residents, and so on. After many meetings, our focus groups and their co-facilitators began piecing together a report. Within this report, our members created wish lists of things that they would like to see done, changed, and preserved within our community. From these wish lists, recommendations were also produced relating to each focus. However, five other executive recommendations were produced that each focus group felt was important for the advancement of our community and their cause. After a year of talking about what, had, uh, what needed to be done, the task force wanted to take action. This is why their first recommendation was to start a new mission, to rank their recommendations in the report, determine their feasibility, and work with the community to make them happen. To assist in their new mission, they wanted to see an Office of Sustainability created to staff the tax, task force and to implement the recommended actions. Third, they wanted to see the Sustainable Economic Summits become an annual event to serve as a benchmark and also to bring the community together and share our progress. They also wanted to see the report incorporated into the county economic and workforce development plans. <coughs> Finally, their uh, last recommendation was to support the expansion of broadband access in the county. They understood how vital internet access was for economic development, employment, and education, not just Netflix. Once this report was published, everyone got together to celebrate and share their ideas at the second summit, where the final report was unveiled. We had speakers from the Western Pennsylvania Coalition for Abandoned Mine Reclamation, from the Green Building Alliance, the Department of Agriculture, and New Sun Rising. We also had a speaker from Solar United Neighbors, which is represented here today. It was with their guidance that the Indiana County Solar Co-op first began. As a result of the success of the task force, our organization also received a Local Foods, Local Places grant from the US EPA. There we go. Indiana County was one of 16 communities nationwide to be selected. Through workshops and meetings, the Local Foods, Local Places uh, group began their own engagement process to discover ways to provide residents of Indiana County access to healthy and locally produced foods, while also working to improve our local economy by supporting agriculture. Among many other sustainable activities that have taken place since the summit was the SOAR co-op previously mentioned, which is to date the most successful in all of Pennsylvania. Our numbers so in relation to membership and solar installations exceed any other co-op in Pennsylvania, and that includes Allegheny County, which is something I think we should be proud about. Other activities included the publication of the Environmental Committee of Indiana County's League of Women Voters All About Plastics Packet, which is an informational packet that teaches people the history of plastics, their development, um, and you know, better ways to recycle them. In addition to this, 
Um, the Indiana Borough uh, improved their 8th Street lot by in introducing green infrastructure and electric vehicle charging station. A local Boy Scout collected plastic bags to be turned into a park bench to donate to his school. Indiana Borough also help, uh, helped uh, host a rain barrel workshop, which as you can see, made some of our community members very happy. But what about those five executive recommendations? After the second summit, the Indiana County Commissioners officially authorized the task force to continue operating. In March of this year, we gathered our task force members and each focus group prioritized and ranked the feasibility of their recommendations, as was our goal. Once two top recommendations emerged, I met with each of the group's co-facilitators to begin up producing plans. We are now looking for funding, people to get involved, and opportunities to take action. In addition to authorizing our organization, the, community count, uh, the county commissioners also adopted our report. To support the goal of staffing the task force, Act fun, uh, 13 funding was allocated to pay a part-time sustainability coordinator, myself. <laughs> Over the summer, an additional staff member joined our, joined our team for her internship. Gabriella Millette, a geoscience major, served as my assistant and my saving grace. Thank you, Gabriella. She'll be here today. As a permanent full-time employee, I still am tasked with performing as a sustainability coordinator to the task force. So although I don't have an office of sustainability, I do have a very, very nice cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> Working towards our broadband goal, a state senate, oh, sorry there. Working towards our broadband goal, a state senate committee was held at Blue Spruce Park to hear citizens talk about how disparities in internet access ac across the county are affecting them. As reported by the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Blue Spruce Park has no internet or cell phone service, even though it's only six miles from our county seat. Our commissioner Ruddick spoke up and drew attention to the safety risks a lack of connection possess, er, poses. Finally, our last executive recommendation of holding annual summits was satisfied by this event today and you all joining us here. Thank you for joining us. We're always looking for people to get more involved. Um, the report I mentioned is posted at sustainableindianacounty.org. There you can regularly find updates on our progress as a task force um, and other events that we're holding. In your packets today, you'll find an evaluation form for the summit and also a small sheet that says, you know, join us. We ask that you fill out the evaluation forms so that way we know what we're doing right in relation to this event and also as a task force. Your feedback is very important to us. We'd also appreciate it if you filled out the participation form if you would like to continue receiving information on the task force, whether it be newsletters or different opportunities to volunteer. We want to make sure that we're not bothering you by inviting you to too many events or filling up your uh, inbox with newsletters. So if you let us know what you would like to receive and what level of involvement you would like, that'd be very helpful to us. Going forward, each of the panels is, uh, going forward with each of the panels, I ask them three questions that they will answer today. What they have done as a group, what they would like to see done in the community, and what the community has done in relation to their focus. So I'm going to give the floor to them now. We'll start with the Agriculture and Building Constructions Group, or sorry, Renewable Energy Group. Two, two different groups, yes, yeah, Agriculture will go first. I just wanted to invite you both up to the table. Thank you, sorry about that. All right. Ms. K. Snyder. Dr. Snyder. It's okay. Hi there. And I'm very pleased to be re representing the Sustainable Agriculture Group uh, that has been meeting over a period of time and also was very involved in the local foods, local places. This one. Like. It was only 10 days or so after the last summit, summit two, that we had the local foods, local places, two-day workshop with federal, regional, 
and state partners. I see a few of them in the room here right now. That involved uh, many months leading up to that that involved uh, those of us in Indiana County. What's important to mention about this is that this program came from the Sustainable Indiana County Task Force. And as I talked to the, the people that had given, um, had us become one of the um, 16 sites throughout the United States, it was clear that the reason that we were selected was because they felt, because of this base that had to do with the partners that were communicating with one another, uh, this strong base, that that was extremely important in their, our, our being selected because they felt that we really could pull this off in terms of coming up with a community assessment that would lead then to uh, um, a community tour, community meeting, and creating an action plan. Uh, the goals of that program, of the Local Foods, Local Places program, that uh, has support through the EPA, USDA, CDC, the Appalachian Regional Commission, um, is really to do a lot of things that the Sustainable Economic Development Task Force is doing, um, bringing, creating more economic opportunities for local farmers and businesses, better access to healthy local food, especially among disadvantaged groups, and revitalizing downtown, downtowns, main streets, and neighborhoods. And so um, after the, um, this two-day time where we were working very hard, then there were subs subsequent phone calls that involved our partners. And coming up with what is on the website, and I thank, thank the fact that we now do have a sustainable Indiana County website, and we can put information up. But if you've not seen it, um, it's called Community Action Plan for Indiana, Pennsylvania. And uh, it uh, provides uh, a number of, of things that I think are really exciting in terms of things happening in Indiana. Um, in February uh, 2019, we had an action plan launch, and that there were 65 people that were there. There were a few people connected by phone online that uh, reviewed the action plan and then gave additional feedback. So what I'd like to do is give you a bit of update on that. And you might say, why are you talking so much about this when this is about the Sustainable Agriculture Group? Well, really, as you hear in a minute what our focus has been in that group, this really has provided a basis for moving forward with a number of things. Um, because our time is limited, I'm only going to highlight a few things that are happening. Uh, again, um, I encourage anyone to have conversations with any of us, um, indicate things you'd like to pursue further, and so on. One of the goals of uh, our uh, community action plan has been to support increased food access, resource awareness, and education through collaborative relationships. And part of that, one area where a lot's happened in the last year has been revitalizing and expanding youth access to edible gardens and nutrition education. In a bit, uh, Chloe Hatcher and her, and her twin, uh, Je Jenica, are going to be speaking a bit more, and I think they will say more about some of the efforts that Chloe's been involved as youth garden educator at the Indiana Community Garden. But during the past year, there have been a number of additional programs that have taken place uh, working with children. Uh, one big one has been that the YMCA has moved their day camp for young children to the uh, to Mac Park, and they have come down to the to the garden to do various kinds of educational programs. And I remember when Chloe said to me, "I think this is the first day of that of that program." Uh, you said that, but you'd ask about. Uh, what fruits and vegetables that people, uh, the children were eating, and one of them said Fruit Loops. 
<laughs> At which point, Chloe knew this was really important, that this was reaching uh, a wider group. 40% of the day camp involves uh, uh, children that are on the, uh, receive school lunches, free school lunches, and that this was a really an outreach to a group beyond which we had tended to reach within the Indiana uh, community garden. Uh, another area that um, is, has been developing separate from this group and Local Foods, Local Places has been a group of high school teachers who have been working on trying to get at Indiana High School through a USDA uh, farm to school grant um, are hoping to get a greenhouse to be used at the high school for educational um, programs. And what, even though they were working on it separately, at some point it came to their attention that there were those of us in the community that have been talking about issues of sustainable agriculture for some time. And part of the magic of this group is the fact that once that connection was made, there were many links that they could make. And one thing they also realized that is that they were going to wait an additional year and do more homework before trying to apply for, for this, this grant. Mm -hmm. But I would say this group and, and this task force in general has been really, really important in this effort to, to link different people together and suggest ways for, for moving forward. Uh, Shireen had mentioned to me as well that the Urban Institute is working with ICAP on food insecurity in Indiana County. One of the things that struck me as I started to try to figure out what all has been happening here is that it's, it's clear that in a county like this where agriculture has been so important, there are many, many things going on. And one function that the task force really can play is ways that when things come to the attention of others to put, to connect people together that can start uh, having more conversations. So for example, the proposed construction of the new Indiana County Conservation District headquarters that is to include space for additional educational programming for both students and adults, which is music to the ears of those of us in nonprofits who often can't find a place to meet that is that we can I can see some heads nodding here um, that where we could go where it, it it would be free that we could afford it that we can have some meeting space with the appropriate technology and so on. Another goal that the local foods local places group um, uh, had was helping aspiring and current entrepreneurs to develop sustainable agriculture or food-related enterprises. And I'm delighted to share with you, and there's copies on the table over there, um, uh, on the uh, table for the Indiana Farmers Market. I have copies at, at my table. A farmer and food entrepreneur workshop uh, that uh, will be held on Saturday, November 2nd, 2019. Again, the details are here. We'll make sure this is one of the beauties of us having a website and a way to coordinate these activities. But um, one of the realizations is there, if we're going to build capacity, we need to have ways so that people that are moving into farming or food entrepreneur activities can learn about the really important issues like liability, business planning, and, and so on. So, um, and this is something that that happened um, as a result of um, uh, the lead that Darlene Livingston took as a lead on this, but getting a USDA agricultural uh, research marketing grant um, and, and combined with PA FarmLink and a variety of other programs in order to make this happen. Um, additionally, and this is a little bit further down the road, but there's another grant that, again, uh, Darlene played an incredibly important role in helping secure so that there could be, within the next two years, an information, uh, informational workshop for farmers, food entrepreneurs, on the requirements for selling specialty crops to institutions and the tools to meet those 
requirements. Again, important in terms of capacity building. You're going to hear more about that again. A grant is making that possible as well. One other part of the local foods, local places program uh, and the goal of it has, has been uh, improving walkability and connectivity from the surrounding neighborhoods to, to downtown. Indiana, again, doesn't have as much to do with sustainable agriculture, but one of the things that's occurred to many of us as we've moved forward with these initiatives is that these things are not siloed. When we're going to bring economic development, it may mean how do you bring people into Indiana for the farmer's market? Um, and that is to downtown Indiana. These things need to work together. And so there's been a variety of things that are happening that are beginning to move some of those efforts forward. One of them, one of them is that um, Dr. Susan Bozier and a doctoral student worked on a, on a survey that has been shared now with the Indiana Farmers Market Board um, of uh, possible customers at the farmers market. Um, as well as some in-depth interviews uh, with, for example, aging services, people from the food bank, um, to figure out how do we make this work better? How do we provide more information? They also shared with, for people who didn't know about the farmer's market information about where it was, when it was. Uh, again, it's just the beginning of this effort to make sure there's enough information so that groups like the farmer's market can make decisions based on data of how to move forward. Uh, one of the things that came up in this is that um, a lot of people don't know about the farmer's market. And I'm hoping, and I'm looking at people from the borough here, that at some point that some ordinances can get changed so that it's possible to have better signage, which was another issue that, that we talked about with that. Um, Again, people working together, it's clear that that is often what is really needed to make things happen in Indiana uh, County. And out of that same survey, another part of it was in talking, for example, to aging services and the food bank is ways that we can work together to figure out how transportation can be provided yeah, I got to finish up. Uh, transportation can be provided for people that may not have mobility issues, may not have uh, a car, and so on. So a lot of things are happening. Um, a lot more needs to be done. We're hoping to start mapping out where all the different uh, agricultural um, industries, farms, and so on are throughout the county so that we can use that information to, uh, again, let people know about this hidden secret that we have in Indiana, which is an incredible lot of, of, of incredible things going on. Thank you. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Glad to be here to talk about the Renewable Energy Focus Group of the Indiana County Sustainable Economic Development uh, Summit 3. So I work now for Indiana Borough, but at the last summit, I did not. I was just participating as a member of the community. And it has been with great pleasure that I now work for your local government and get to be an active proponent of renewable energy, or at least allowing the residents uh, to have a clear path to use it themselves. So when we met in the last summit, our council president, Peter Broad, had said, let's have a solar co-op and host it in the borough. And that was successful, wildly successful. We had to move in extra seats from the borough building into the council chambers to accommodate all the people. So that was the citizen-led uh, energy that propels our current renewable energy drive in this county. And as a part of that, the focus group met to prioritize our goals. Renewable energy is kind of big, 
a lot of our goals are pretty large. So Indiana County is the center of electric generation, has been for a long time. We have an awful lot of infrastructure that is very expensive to build anymore. Uh, so that's the distribution lines. And our focus group had discussed all of this, everything from uh, hydroelectric power to solar to wind, to the fact that we in this county can incorporate almost limitless amounts of this renewable energy and never reach a bottleneck where we can't distribute it to the rest of the country. Uh, for instance, in the future, maybe we'll be able to power the East Coast with renewable energy because we have those lines, those transmission lines that feed those population centers. And those pop population centers want that type of electricity. So those are the big ideas, but we had to distill it down into two goals. And our two goals were to have a point person, one person that could advocate for sustainable energy and renewable energy throughout Indiana County. Our second goal was to have a demonstration project. So I feel like we have met some of our goals. We now have uh, Molly Sarver, who's employed in the county and can act as a coordinator for this sustainable economic uh, group. Uh, we also have gone to the county to advocate for the use of solar, for instance, at selected county sites in order to decrease the cost of utility bills at those sites. Uh, developing a demonstration project is difficult, especially now that I work within local government, it's hard for government to do this. You have to have a site, the site has to be adequate, you have to have capital, um, and it's a long process, but we are doing that. And that is a long-term goal. Uh, so in order to reach those two goals, uh, we made steps. But the citizens, the residents of this county really did lead the way whenever it comes to renewable energy. Because out of that initial solar co-op meeting, we've now had a successful uh, Solar United Neighbors solar co-op, wildly successful. And I work in a planning and zoning office right next to a code office for our uniform construction code uh, permits the permits that allow people to build things in our community in the borough and in the county, the solar permits are in the top percentage. That means that in the past 10 months, whenever it comes to economic development, that's jobs. Uh, we were talking about workforce development. Well, right now we have nine installations just in the borough. I believe there's another uh, six or so outside of the borough, maybe seven, and another one that just submitted a permit uh, this week, I believe, or the past week. So when it comes to our un uniform construction code work, that's the big construction work that requires a lot of vetting, uh, they are on, like in the, that top percentage. So that's developing workforce. And now we're seeing solar, other solar uh, contractors moving into the area. So it's creating a ecosystem where different renewable energy companies are creating jobs paying for permits through municipal government, which helps fund me. Um, <laughs> like it, turning some of the perceptions of renewable energy in a more positive light. So that is kind of where we're at, where, where we have now a successful point person and maybe someday we'll be able to get an office for that position. Then that's a goal still. Um, and then we are pursuing renewable energy at selected sites to do the educational component, to talk to people about how reducing our carbon footprint is important, that this is a global uh, priority. So our demonstration project can be used for the schools to encourage students to be aware of their environment and to draw them into all of these other sustainable focus group initiatives. Uh, but really it was the citizens. I mean, it's been the pleasure of my new, my career so far, mm -hmm. to watch residents adopt solar energy. And solar energy isn't the only renewable energy. At a, as we scale up what the residents have done with the, on their private residential solar units to businesses or governments, we are going to shape the future, because these are the technologies that are going to be around in another 50 years. So it's 
been a pleasure. Uh, I'm trying in my profession to support <coughs> residents throughout the borough and through our the solar co-op at the county level to, to make it easier for residents and citizens to go solar. Uh, for that, we have gone through, started the process of becoming a soul smart community. That's a Department of Energy program where we've looked at our code and we're well positioned to get a silver designation as a soul smart community. Essentially, that means that Department of Energy and National League of Cities have looked at our code, zoning, and all the requirements. If, say, a citizen comes in and says, I want to go solar. Well, we can say we will be able to turn that around pretty quick because we don't want to stand in your way. Uh, that's how we are going to support the residents' movement. But to speak about the, the solar co-op, uh, I give you Jonathan Warnock. Uh, he can speak to this group better than I can. Good, yeah, sound, okay. Thank you everybody for being here, thank you for having me. I'm just here to spend a couple of minutes to talk about the story of the Solar Co-op because it's a huge success that grew out of this group and this summit. At last year's summit, we had a presentation by Henry McKay from Solar United Neighbors, and that's a nonprofit group that helps to facilitate large groups of people going solar, being able to create their own energy. And Henry presented about the concept of a co-op. The basic idea is that the co-op is a bargaining unit. We get a bunch of households together that are interested in creating their own energy through solar power. And with this large purchasing power, we get competitive bids that we can reduce the price of solar. Ultimately, the co-op selected Groundhog uh, Solar to install the panels for everyone within the co-op. We paid about two-thirds the price of what an average Pennsylvania solar installation would have cost per household, so a really uh, incredible savings, <clears throat> excuse me, to be able to help people uh, make this process. And so at the, at the summit last year, Henry gave this presentation. Peter Broad, the borough president, said, let's go for it. We're going to do this. And at that point, people were energized. And so I started advertising, and other people started advertising, and we just started talking and working as a community. Through those efforts developed out of this summit, we were able to create the most successful co-op in the state in terms of the number of households to come on board and show interest, and that does include uh, beating out Allegheny County. We were also able, <laughs> thank you. We're also able to be very successful in the number of installations that have occurred. So as of yesterday, 17 contracts had been signed for household solar within the county with several contracts still pending. So we might get up to 21 or 22 households within the county now able to generate their own electricity. Each one of those contracts is jobs for solar installers. Um, Groundhog is based out of Greensburg, so we're keeping everything local in Pennsylvania. Altoona, oh my goodness, thank you. Um, as well as the roofers and people that have had to help get the homes ready for uh, for the solar panels. So it's been really successful in that way. We're very happy with everything that has happened. If you're interested in learning more about this sort of thing, there's a couple upcoming events. Evergreen Conservancy is hosting an information session about solar uh, that Henry McKay will be at to talk about Solar United Neighbors. That's on the 11th. Yeah. At Blue Spruce Raj, thank you. And then we're having a solar tour on the 13th. There's still time to sign up. You can sign up for the solar tour through the Indiana County Sustainable Economic website. And the solar tour will take you around the county, look at some of these solar installations, look at the variety of different types of installations, learn about how it works with homes, how it works with Penelac or REA or whoever your energy provider originally was. Um, so that opportunity is still available. And finally, I'd like to say we've actually been able to move forward even farther with a no upfront cost project so the Unitarian Universalist Church is going to be going solar and Groundhog Solar is willing to work with them so there will be no upfront cost to the church. And then once the solar panels are installed, instead of paying their electric bill, they'll be paying the solar loan. Once that solar loan is paid off, they're free and clear, making their own power and making money. So, um, so far it's been very successful, everything that's developed out of the past year, and we look forward to uh, continuing into the future. Thank you.
So <clears throat> at least originally we had closing remarks. This may be overblown, but I just want to point out Indiana Borough's table is in the back. And I would I need to give them a uh, suggest people go over and look because we have a wide range of sustainable initiatives, uh, including we can demonstrate that solar technologies operate on the inside of a building when the sun's over there and it's charging. We're generating in this room, small amount, probably not even enough to turn on a light bulb, but it works even in cloudy places. Uh, so check out the Indiana Borough table. We have some interesting things and thank you to the county for supporting this because a lot of what we do wouldn't happen without this group right here. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Josh Krug. I work with the Indiana County Office of Planning and Development. I'm Deputy Planning Director for the Planning, uh, Deputy Director of the Planning Section. Uh, I've had the privilege to work with this group over the last number of years, uh, well, since the first summit and beyond uh, through facilitating uh, the, the process of uh, developing the report. Um, I served as a co-facilitator specifically with this building materials and construction uh, focus group. Had a real great group. We put together a lot of good ideas that are available uh, to, to be um, dissected and, and um, implemented uh, if you're so able. Um, th those are available on the website in its entirety in the appendix of the report. But of course we had to distill those down into priorities. Uh, we worked with Molly over the last year um, with great success to, uh, to further uh, refine those priorities into two uh, key action items. Um, that's helped us to narrow our focus. Um, our focus group um, does not necessarily have the infrastructure in place um, here in Indiana County that some of the other groups may already have, and that's a goal that we're looking to get to uh, overall. Um, but uh, working with Vera um, over the last uh, few months um, to try to get ahead of some of these priorities has been, has been great. And what I want to do is uh, just run through the priorities, and uh, then I'm going to hit on what has been done in relation to those. And uh, then I'll hand it over to Vera for some of her perspective and to discuss some of the community happenings that uh, relate to this topic. So uh, when we refined our priorities, we ended up with two, like I mentioned. Uh, one I'll call more low hanging fruit and the other is more of a long range goal. Both are feasible, but both take a different amount of work, uh, effort and a different route to achieving success. Um, the first is, um, well, the first is actually the, the, the um, long-term goal of establishing an innovation center. And an innovation center uh, would be uh, for the development and testing of new products and practices related to sustainable building uh, construction and development. Um, so we developed phases for how to, to achieve these, these goals, kind of like subtasks. And uh, phase one is researching existing innovation centers. Um, you know, what exists in our area? What do they do? How did they establish themselves? Uh, what are the difference between an innovation center and a makerspace is something we wanted to answer. And we found that they're similar. <laughs> really, they're whatever you want them to be. Uh, it, you know, it's more of a concept. Um, and, and what they do um, uh, generally is uh, they, they provide access um, to technology, uh, tools, uh, workspace, um, assistance in different ways um, and in different amounts. And uh, they allow people to create and innovate um, by providing those, those uh, to, to folks. And um, how did they establish themselves? We found uh, universities and schools have, have uh, been a common place uh, where these have uh, nested and grown. And um, then uh, phase two was networking. And uh, we wanted to visit an innovation center. We knew that there's a makerspace and innovation center at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, last, uh, over the last week, uh, Vera and I were down there to, to tour that, and we, we brought a lot back with us. Um, and uh, we want to begin developing a list of networks, relevant funding sources, and program stakeholders. The second priority, priority B, of citizen education, um, this is what I'll call the low-hanging fruit. There's a lot that can be done with regards to this, but it seems to be quite achievable, and we're hoping within this upcoming 
year to actually implement some of these great ideas. So uh, citizen education we described as an education effort addressing the lifespan, consumption, and maintenance of buildings and their materials. Uh, this product would encourage property owners to adopt sustainable and energy efficient practices that save money and reduce wasteful energy use. Citizens would be taught what they need to address in their, home, um, in their home to reduce energy use and prolong building lifespan, how to capitalize on different programs, et cetera. We are happy today that the speaker for our focus group is from the Keystone Energy Efficiency Alliance, so it does directly pair with this particular priority. Um, but in terms of phasing, uh, we want to develop conferences and workshops. We want to develop partnerships with local municipalities and nonprofits. Uh, we want to look at applying for grants to fund a workshop series, potentially. Uh, we want to reach out to the Chamber of Commerce and involve business owners in this particular effort. And uh, we'd like to advertise funding sources and workshops to citizens as well, um, citizens and businesses alike. Uh, phase two for this particular priority would be, uh, you know, um, having a sustainable building conference. Um, so a little bit more of a uh, long term goal, um, but that's why it's phase two. <laughs> Uh, panels of consultants, material producers, nonprofits, teaching business owners, homeowners, etc. Um, it could be an educational conference. You know, for this event, we only get one speaker, so it would be an opportunity to bring in more folks in different fields and specific areas in relation to building materials and construction. Um, one idea that we do have that we're looking to implement within the next year to further that particular goal is we do want to piggyback on the home show and then have a, a table there. We, we probably could have done that this past year. We, we didn't. Um, we, were, we were remiss in not doing that. Um, so uh, that's something that we're looking forward to the, to the next year. Um, I've talked enough. I'm going to hand it over to Vera, I think. Well, we're going to make up for the time that was spent in our early, the earlier focus groups and make this a little bit shorter. Um, uh, our construction focus group, as um, he was saying, uh, we don't have any um, infrastructure on the ground. We don't have committees uh, at the way Ag does and some of the other groups do. But um, we've been taking um, some steps, as Josh has said. Uh, unfortunately, the solar co-op movement has... Uh, taken over the construction part of our uh, talk, <laughs> so that we're going to be uh, talking about other things. Um, we, um, I have looked into uh, weatherization programs. In the area of construction, weatherization is an important part of um, uh, saving energy, energy efficiencies, and not everybody can afford to weatherize their homes. There are a lot of, there's a lot of demand in this county. There are a lot of old homes, some of them are old cold patches, and people just can't afford to do it. So um, there is an organization, and uh, in, unfortunately it's in Jefferson County, it's the Jefferson County Community Action Program that is doing weatherization, not only in Jefferson, but also in Indiana and in Clarion. So they are somewhat overextended, as I learned. Um, they, um, they will do, for qualifying individuals, obviously, they will do their weatherization. They have numerous problems, however. The first being that they don't have the workforce. Uh, the workforce, uh, they have a, a real problem getting people to actually do the work. Um, the fact that the uh, homes are so spread out, we live in this rural county, and going from place to place with workers who are getting paid by the hour and not producing while they're traveling is a problem. So they're constantly looking for new people. If you look on their website, there is a big you know, sign saying workforce needed. Um, they're hard to find. Um, there's also changing requirements um, for uh, for approval, they need they need to be certified, and as every time the requirements change, they have to re, be recertified. So that's another hurdle to get to getting qualified workers. So last time I spoke to them, there was a two to three year waiting list for people who needed to weatherize their home, who wanted to were applied to weatherize their home, and couldn't. They just couldn't get the work done. So um, and that includes all of Indiana County, or much of Indiana County. Now, um, the one 
bright spot in our uh, in our work is that I discovered that we do have uh, an innovation center that's getting started at IUP. It's called the STEAM Shop. Okay, so you recognize S-T-E-M, STEM is what? It's uh, science, science, technology, engineering, and math. The A in the STEAM Shop refers to the art, arts. The STEAM Shop will be located in the arts department uh, in the Robert Shaw building. I don't know if you know where that is. Um, and is being actually uh, initiated by the arts department. It's going to be a digital fabrication lab, an innovation hub. It's a makerspace, essentially. It'll provide precision fabrication equipment um, that comes from, it's a digital, it's a digital technology. It's known in the trade as CNC, Computer Numerically Controlled Equipment. And currently, the people that, will, that are using it um, are art students, the jewelry department, and I think the woodworking department. Um, they have equipment right now, uh, they have a laser engraver um, and a milling machine. A laser engraver for cutting wood, acrylic, and fiber, and the milling machine for aluminum, foam, and wood. I have here somewhere an example of what kind of work they do, okay? They can do. This is in wood. These are, uh, what are they called? Dovetails, right? And they go together, they form a box. Now this is obviously a very small example of what they can do, but um, this can be applied to larger and other kinds of construction. Um, this, we visited uh, a makerspace at Carnegie Mellon University it was sequestered in a basement of the engineering department. It was not something that was available to the public. Um, and, and, but um, there are comparable uh, makerspaces in lots of universities. Um, the other one I think I saw was Penn State. The student demographic at IEP is very different. It doesn't fit into the stereotype of typical users of this kinds of equipment. They're from many, many of them are from rural and lower income families, so they don't get exposure to this kind of equipment. But the benefit for the community is that um, it's going to go eventually when it gets up to speed into a membership model, which will allow access to the public for a fee. Uh, you can join and you can use the equipment. Um, they're hoping to get not just individuals, but also to allow high school students and students from the um, tech center to use the equipment. So um, there is an economic development component to it as well. They're hoping to help prospective entrepreneurs uh, to nurture their ideas and stimulate economic growth in the county. So they will be providing collaborative teams, including faculty, alumni, regional experts to provide guidance to individuals for product development, marketing, business plan development, and so on. So the idea is not just to prototype ideas, but also to make them market ready. So that is the, this, the that's the most exciting thing we have to uh, really uh, speak about and uh, let you know, let you in on it, I hope you, uh, are impressed <laughs> as we were. So thank you very much. And we move on. So I'm going to be speaking about the Environmental Restoration and Stewardship Focus Group and what we did as a focus group since the last summit. So we, like everybody else, got together and tried to break our goals and our desires and our action steps down to two priorities. So one of them was to increase riparian buffer zones and greenways in the county. Now, what the heck does that mean? A lot of people don't have any idea what a riparian buffer zone is. And basically, it's really aimed at better water quality, um, decreasing erosion, cooling the water, 
We are losing animals and insects at an alarming rate across the world, and they're vanishing for different reasons, including loss of habitat, and that means native plants, native trees. Um, it's an it's an amazing concept that insects have evolved with certain plants, and without those plants, they die. So we're losing insects and animals, and we need to reestablish native plants, native trees, and that's part of riparian buffer zone planting because those are going to support animals, pollinators, um, insects, bugs, fish, everything. So what we want to do is one of the first goals was to increase these buffer zone plantings. And the actual measure of success would be how many trees we've planted, how many acres we've planted, how many, how many acres or miles of streams we've rehabilitated. We've started this process. We've investigated a couple places to plant, do plantings. And we've also looked at what has been done in the county this year. We have um, partnered with a number of different people to do these projects. And we also want to encourage countywide ordinances and plans that are going to support the future goal of increasing green spaces and uh, greenways and riparian buffer zones. Our second goal was education because a lot of people don't realize the importance of native plants, the, imp the importance of greenways, um, not only for animals and us because there's a food chain out there and we're sort of at the top of the food chain. So th there's some in research out there that says 30% of our food supply is from pollinators. And if we're losing pollinators, we're gonna be out some food in, in the future. So we need to sort of change our concept of what's a beautiful, in, instead of a beautiful manicured lawn, the fact that weeds and natives are really important out there. So those are some of the educational ideas that we need to do. We have partners like Friends of the Parks, um, who will be presenting some programs in 2020. Evergreen Conservancy plans on hosting some programs about riparian buffer zones and their benefits. Western Pennsylvania Conservancy does this on a regular basis. And you heard Kay talk about the community garden programs, which are a great place to start, because if we get kids to understand some of this, it's gonna, the adults will follow. If, if, we, if we start getting the kids out there to enjoy being outdoors and, and get some of that buy-in. So what we want to see done is to actually get out there and plant some plants and trees and, and increase the greenways and the buffer zones. We've sort of identified Blacklick Watershed as our first goal, but we may be doing it anywhere in the county. Tulick, Yellow Creek, a lot of little streams go into Blacklick and are part of the watershed. So we may be popping up anywhere to do some riparian buffer zones. We're in the process of setting up a fundraiser to raise money to complete some of these riparian buffer zones next spring, maybe an adopt a trade program. We're also looking at other grants that we may be able to apply for to, and maybe even do some crowdfunding. So we're, we've started to look into those things to help fund this as well as um, some grants. The other thing is, is we have to have a place to put these trees and to develop these. So if anybody in this audience has some land that runs along a stream bank and wants to change that, that culture of a perfect green lawn that goes up to the stream bank that doesn't provide shading for the creek, that doesn't provide cooling, that doesn't provide erosion control, that doesn't provide uh, a habitat for the animals and the critters in the stream and the fish and eventually the fishermen, then let's get some trees planted in there and some riparian buffer zones that we can build on that habitat. Let us know if you're interested because we're looking for places to increase riparian buffer zones. We are going to buy trees locally so and, and plants locally, so that will help um, in the economy of this area. The Confluence Park renovations, I don't know how many of you know about that, but that's an IUP project. That is going to be directly affecting Tulip Creek, and that's in the Black Lake watershed. And its master plan is completed to develop about 35 acres behind the Hilton Inn on IUP grounds. 
it's going to have riparian buffer zones, wetlands, green technology, possibly an education center, more green space, right in the, right in the middle of Indiana. It's a beautiful spot that's going to be developed. We want also to see an adoption on a municipal level to support greenways and riparian buffer zones. And we need to do that. Um, that's sort of a future goal for us. We need to research what other counties have done as far as regulatory land use policies are. Take a, make a list of that, look at what we possibly could do here in our county, look at zoning that would permit regulations on lawns that would encourage native plantings, rain gardens, uh, stormwater mitigation. We, we, we want to see the culture of those manicured lawns and exotic alien plants change to more native plants. And that's sort of difficult because we've come to think that, that those manicured lawns are the beautiful lawns. And we need to change that for our health as well as our animals and, and critters that are out there. So we're going to be working on continued education in a lot of different ways, a lot of different venues, a lot of different situations. But we also wanted to talk a little bit today about economic growth. And Laurie's going to talk about that a little bit. Because the environment is going to drive economic growth in our county. I'll be back. <laughs> See what you mean, Molly. I mean, I used to be 5'6", and now I need a stool just to look over a mic. Gee. Um, one thing I wanted to add about Cindy's presentation was about adoption on a municipal level to support greenways and riparian zone. And the county has, through their comprehensive plan and accompanying plans, um, they have language in there for that. And at this moment, uh, Indiana County Office of Planning and Development is working on, and we're in the final stages, of developing our SALDO, Subdivision and Land Development Ordinance. And there are, there's various language in there identifying riparian zones and greenways, et cetera. So it is ongoing. We just need to actually start that wheel movement. So um, I'm speaking on economic growth. Um, the name of this group is the Indiana County Sustainable Economic Development. And the mission is to identify new opportunities in economic development, citizen education and job training or workforce development in the four areas and in our environmental area. And it's really the most difficult to come up with how are we going to do that? Because when you think of the environment, you don't think of economic development or job training. So I, I see it as an opportunity to really have Indiana County instead of saying, oh, this county's doing that, this county's doing that. I would like to see this Sustainable Development Task Force turn the box over and say, why can't we make the environment an economic development movement? We have a first-class university here. There's probably some curriculum that already has something that we can do to actually create jobs. It, I mean, we have water that's red and dead. If we had research, and with research, gee, people come. You, there are grants out there for research. Water is becoming one of the most valuable, commod well, clean water, clean potable water. So why couldn't we become the forefront? You know, this university could be recognized. I would like to challenge the Office of uh, Planning to come up with a workshop and just have a brainstorming session of young people, not the usual suspects, because we've looked at this box in at every which way and we can't come up with anything. We have Penn State, we have Pitt, we have Carnegie Mellon, and we have IUP. And there are departments that interlink we have started a sustainability <coughs> curriculum here at IUP. I think we can expand that to think differently, creatively, to actually be an economic generator. The more things you have available, the greater. In the meantime, we're still working to make sure that Indiana County has a wonderful environment. 
Last Friday, we had a ceremony celebrating 25 years of the Ghost Town Trail. It's been in existence 25 years. We, thank you. We have over 46 miles and we're growing. The goal, and it's, it will be in my lifetime, will be to connect from um, Evans, or beyond Ebensburg to the Allegheny Ridge, Allegheny Portage Railroad. The um, group on the other side is working to meet us there from the Lauer Trail through Holidaysburg. We're going to get from Blairsville to meet them. And then the other groups on the other side in Westmoreland, and a lot of it is built to go to Pittsburgh and eventually Washington, D.C. Now, this is a huge economic generator. Tourism, people want to live in a place that's clean and green. And I really pushed hard for the Greenway plan to be in the Black Lick watershed because look at the investment we already have there. We have trails. We're bringing... I think Ed Patterson said um, over the past 25 years, we've brought a million and a half visitors. So that's a lot of eyes looking at us, and we need to take advantage of that. With the resources that we have that are in existence, like trails, parks, um, uh, other um, activities that we have that relate to the environment, we could perhaps get a grant, right, Byron? To do, I, I mean, you're working on the, you're working. I'm giving you a lot of work. Um, you're working on the economic development portion of the package of plans that we have with a comprehensive. Couldn't we include uh, a quantitative report in there? Uh, it's really hard with the environment to quantify it. People are there. It's just all feel good. Perhaps we could incorporate that in the economic development portion of that plan to quantify ways to show with real numbers how it is an economic developer. So that's all I have to say. There are other economic growth factors that directly involve the environment, there's landscape companies in our county that are expanding their services by offering green services, maintenance on rain gardens, native planting. That's, that's economic development in our area. You've heard about the solar installations. Investing in our natural resources is really, as Laurie said, directly related to economic growth and development. People are attracted to the area. Tourism, um, I know there's some people from the Tourist Bureau here, they know how valuable that is. There's real estate has shown an increase in the value of homes when there's trails and green spaces near those homes. Back east where I'm from originally, um, it's all, it's all, it's like a megalopolis from DC to New York and there are no green spaces. And back then, the, when the trails first went in, people said, ooh, I don't want my house back near that. Now, the real estate value of those homes has increased extra, extra just a huge amount. Um, the bimodal pathways, making it more attractive to people to move into this area. Rural areas are making a comeback using arts and cultures to build communities, making them more attractive. We really want the environment to generate um, economic development and bring people to our area for those reasons. Now, the last part of what we were asked to do was to look at things that have happened in the community related but not directly implemented by the task force. And I just want to mention that Western Pennsylvania Conservancy has done over six acres and 1,350 trees planted this year, and they're just starting their fall planting. So they are out there uh, constantly doing riparian buffer zone plantings. Um, Conser Indiana Conservation District has done 1.2 acres along Altman's Run and 1.5 acres over 300 trees near Bear Run up in the northeast part of our county. Um, Evergreen Conservancy planted about 50 native trees and bushes at Tonoma along Crooked Creek last fall to increase their buffer zones. So it's happening out there. We need to keep it moving and keep it happening. As far as educational programming uh, that's been completed this year, um, I'd like to mention Evergreen Conservancy again because we created a geocache trail with, with 20 sites and every one of those sites has some kind of environmental significance. It went live um, a year and a, 
a year ago, last November, and I am still getting logs every day from geocachers that have come into our county from West Virginia, Ohio, um, all over our all over Pennsylvania who come in and do the geocache trail and learn about watersheds, learn about riparian buffer zones, learn about um, grain gardens, because each cache is, there's a reason for going to each cache. And then when they complete all 20 sites, they get to get a little geocache coin. So that's part of education that's making people, even from our county, more aware of what's in our county. And we've gotten all kinds of comments about that. Uh, the community garden. The conservation district does junior and senior envirothons every year, and they bring in every, well, the senior is senior high school and the junior envirothon is a junior high, but, and that just happened last week. We had kids from every school, plus homeschoolers, seeds of faith, private schools, learning about pollinators, native plants, forestry, soils, um, and that, that's huge in our county. We should be really proud of that. Um, we've done classes on native plants um, and invasive plants. Um, IUP sends students to Tonoma every semester, several different groups and different departments to learn about abandoned mine discharge passive treatment system. So, and, and IUP also does an outdoor class for Indiana high school ninth graders every year on wetlands and water quality, uh, abandoned mine discharge, best management practices. So there's a lot going on, but we got to keep that moving. We got to keep that going on and we got to keep educating people and making people more aware of what's going on in the environment. So I think that's all I have. All right, thank you very much to all of our focus group leaders and members who stepped up today to talk. Um, we're going to give you all a few minutes to ask some questions. Uh, did you hear anything that stood out to you that you'd like to learn, learn more about? Uh, is there anything that you feel like we've missed, any projects that you've heard about that you think should be celebrated? Um, take comments at this time. Oh, yes. Um, this, this question is directed to whether or not there's been any consideration or attention paid to the reality that local farmers are being forced to consider factory farms because they can't make it. So what is being done to try to protect these small farms from being absorbed into the corporate network? I'm sure there's some people in this room that can speak more to this issue than I can, but on behalf of the Sustainable Agricultural Group, that one of the reasons we were putting such an emphasis on various programs uh, like the workshop that's going to be happening on November 2nd to provide capacity for for farmers is to figure out how to deal with that very issue. Um, we clearly were aware in all our conversations about the incredible challenges out there for farmers uh, in a county that's been built on, on farming. And I'm looking out at this audience because uh, I know last time we had, I, I, are there some of the people that are professionals uh, in agriculture that would like to, to add in terms of how to deal with that issue because it's really, really an important one. Looking at you, Tom. He was, he was part of the Sustainable Agriculture Group, and there's others as well. No, I would just like to say, I think Scott Sheely came out here yeah. to the original group and talked a little bit. So I will say the state has put in um, a lot of funding opportunities to diversify some of the smaller uh, groups out there, I think. Um, sheep, goat, and lamb production was something it came up before. I'm trying to think of what else. <clears throat> I, I know uh, G.T. Thompson had been out here a couple times talking a little bit about food security as a reason to keep some of the smaller farms uh, going. So we do a lot of educational programs. If uh, you're looking to kind of expand upon your current farm, something like that. So I guess I don't know what else you're <laughs> kind of looking for on the spot, but yeah, the uh, young agriculture farmers 
systems. They, they had some of those things coming out. So we're looking for alternatives and uh, ways to kind of educate. So, you know, keep us in mind. And we, we appreciate the support from the local, state, and federal side of that to try to keep it. But, but I would say food security, that's something that's come up more and more that people might overlook a little bit. So, because if you have two or three large farms serving a large geographic area, that's, that's difficult. If, if something would come up that would cause them to shut down some of those farms, it, you know, it could be a disaster economically. So I think keeping some of these online strategically, I think you hear that a lot in the dairy industry as well, that the small dairy farms are really critical to food security. And that's something that's pretty important to keep, to keep in mind. So hope that helps. Um, well, I'm not on sustainable agriculture. We do have a farm. And I think part of the problem is that when I hear the farmers out at like four in the morning and they're out there, you know, until sometimes one in the morning working and just doing everything, there's always something to do. And farmers can't attend workshops or conferences. They just can't. And so how do you, that's a real issue. How do you disseminate information to them that's meaningful? You know, when I go to the city, I shop for my meat at Whole Foods. Why? Because it's grass-fed. And Whole Foods always, you know, is saying they're trying to find local farmers for sources of sustainably grown beef, pork, chicken, grass-fed, organic. And they pay good prices for it. You know, you know, there are opportunities to source that kind of food even here at a local level as well as the Pittsburgh markets and as ever with everything it's all economics if they feel they can make you know more money factory farming that's what's going to happen I don't know if Josh you would like to address any um, issue or you know uh, solutions through any of our county plans um, whether it's in you know the land development that we're working on for example, you wouldn't want to factor, if you have a housing development, residential, I don't think you want a factory farm moving right next door to you. And if there, there aren't some sort of controls, how can you stop that from happening? Do you want to say? Uh, well, there's not necessarily in, in, in our salary that we're looking to adopt. I mean, we, we are encouraging land development um, overall, uh, you know, but doing it in, in the right way. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly, um, you need to have the right amount of space depending on what type of operation you're you're looking to to do uh, uh, smaller operations are are exempt you know from from land development uh, typically including the accessory you know structures to to a farming operation um but i would say that, that in my opinion you know i i think that this food security thing's probably the the, the biggest reason why you would want to keep um these things local you know you don't that's the last thing that i personally would want to rely on some sort of corporate structure for is the food that that i need to eat every day and, and we certainly have a comparative advantage here in indiana county in terms of the ability to to grow it on acres that exist here oh we have uh we have enough time to take oh go ahead one more Uh, my name is Beth Marshall. I'm a retired organic vegetable grower, um, a member of the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture, the National Farmers Union, and um, I think that food security is not the only reason why you should support small farmers. Uh, the food they produce tends to be a better quality. Uh, they support the economic environment in their communities. They, uh, right now, there's a huge concentration going on in the agriculture sector. Uh, there are perhaps four or five uh, packing houses for meats that produce 99% of the meat that is sold in grocery stores. Uh, a contractor who contracts to raise chickens on a massive scale 
uh, gets about 10 cents a chicken uh, as a profit and um, is pretty much ordered by <clears throat> whoever he is contracted with, Purdue, for example, um, is told what he, can, what he can feed his chickens, how to get it. He takes all of the financial risks, Purdue gets the chickens. It is, uh, the dairy industry is almost, uh, the small dairy industry in particular, has almost been wiped out by factory farming. And part of that is because of the way milk is sold. And it's regulated strongly by the middleman, or in favor of the middleman, excuse me. Um, there's a lot of things going on that are hurting small farmers. And uh, it's, uh, it's showing in our food and in our economy. Thank you very much, Beth. I think that uh, is a very, <laughs> I think that that really shows why it's so important for our citizen education in regards to agriculture. A lot of people don't know this, and that's why these conversations are so important. Um, we're going to move Molly, on. Molly, may I make a quick, absolutely, quick comment? Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for the comments about that. Pennsylvania just uh, passed its first farm bill. So there is some, I mean, there's a lot of investment being made. And USDA is, um, their farm bill invests heavily, is more into uh, to small farmers too. So there are so, there is some hope. You're absolutely right. And, um, you know, foreign investors buying up a lot of, of private land in the United States is another threat to, to agriculture. So I'd also like to just say that we, there is a lot of waste coal being removed um, from the Ernest and Lucerne Mines coal piles. So that is an economic uh, benefit, beneficiary thing. And also um, the county and the Black Lake Creek Watershed Association are working very hard on an abandoned mine drainage treatment plant on the Wirham uh, sector of the Ghost Town Trail. And that will clean up some 22 miles of, of, the, of the Black Lake Creek, which is going to be a wonderful, wonderful um, advantage to, you know, to bring to that trail. So there are many things happening. You've, this panel's mentioned a lot of them. There are other things going on. These are some real leaders here. I'd also like to just say a, a little bit about our, our um, uh, office planning and development. Uh, Byron Stoffer is the director. Uh, we have a, lot, a couple of staff members here. They're, they're doing um, wonderful things in economic development in general. So we, we are, this is a partnership, and I'm really proud of it. And we're, we're um, Indiana County is a sponsor of the Pennsylvania Economic Development Association's conference coming up, and going to have a terrific speaker about sustainability there. So we're, it's really becoming mainstreamed. And I just want to make that comment that a lot of really wonderful things going on. So thank you, Molly. Thank you, Shereen. We're going to move into um, a short break. Uh, that'll be about 15 minutes. This will give you guys some time to stretch your legs and also talk with some of our exhibitors. Um, our first speaker will be our keynote speaker, Emily Rhodes. Um, we have a lot of wonderful speakers lined up today, so thank you all for coming. <laughs> 